Hi everyone, this is Pradeep from Sydney, welcoming you to yet another episode of GCC and this is episode 22 and the first one for the year 2022. It is 1 a.m. in Sydney in the morning and I am very much awake because I don't sleep normally at 1 a.m. I sleep much later. But jokes apart, I'm looking forward to the session today. We've got some very, very interesting speakers. We are also going to be felicitating one of our own alumni for some fabulous achievement that he's had. And at the same token, one of our speakers has come down with COVID. So, you know, we'll be getting her across in a later session today. So with that, let me kickstart GCC, which is Global Chapters and Connections, a global platform which is working to get IIT Delhi alumni and other professionals and related stakeholders on a single platform on a value-driven basis. I am delighted to welcome and present to you the first speaker of the day, which is Professor Mohit Randeria. He is a professor of physics at Ohio State University. But more importantly, he has been awarded the John Barden 2022 prize for some excellent work that he has done in superconductivity. Now, why does the John Barden Prize become important is because John Barden is the only person in history to have won the Nobel Prize in Physics twice. And with that, first of all, let's give a big round of applause to Mohit. And Mohit, we are absolutely delighted and proud of your achievement. I mean, this is not to say this is just one another feather on his cap. You know. Mohit has got large number of awards and recognition all over the world. In fact, he is also uh, the recipient of Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award in India, which is again a very, very prestigious award. And there are so many of such awards that, uh, uh, you know, I think it will take a lot of time if I have to cite all of them. Needless to say that Mohit is an extremely distinguished physicist, but he is very modest. He is very lovely. He is a lovely person to talk to. And also, just for information, he is also married to another IIT Delhi alumni, who is also a lovely person. Nandini Trivedi, who we had earlier in our GCC session. So once again, Mohit, a big round of applause for you know your achievement recognition, and I know that for you it must be just the norm. But I'm curious to you know also understand your history post IIT Delhi. I know that you started off with engineering. And yes. then veered off into science, which is, you know, quite uncommon, so as to say. So, what happened? And and uh, you've been to all kinds of, you've been to Caltech, you've been to so many other you know, universities. So, first tell us that. And then I would also like to hear about your thoughts about science and society. I think it's a very, very topical theme at this particular point in time. So, over to you, Mohit. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate your kind words, uh, Pradeep, and the opportunity uh, to talk to you. Uh, I think we all live in our cocoons and I don't often get to meet people who work uh, in industry and are titans of you know, finance and uh, the kinds of people you have here. Uh, yeah, so actually when I uh, finished high school, uh, I was quite interested in science and mathematics and my parents were perfectly happy for me to pursue that, but they were highly educated, but not in the science and technology field. They sent me to meet various people who were, 
And they all said that, look, uh, I think if you can get into some good class like electrical engineering, do that. If you still want to do science, you can turn back to science at a later stage in your life. And if you choose to remain as an engineer, you will have many more opportunities in India and elsewhere. So I followed that route and I actually don't regret that uh, because one of the great things that happened in IIT is that the students, the co-students I had in my electrical engineering class were just outstanding. And so I learned as much from them, I think, as I learned from my professors. So that was wonderful. But then when uh, my, at that time, IIT was five years. So at that time when my BTEC degree was coming to an end, I finished all my classes in my fourth year. And I decided I did want to pursue uh, physics. Um, and so that's what I chose to do. And that is also not a decision I regret. And I don't know if uh, all of you understand Hindi because what I'm about to say next doesn't translate particularly well. So let me try it in Hindi. Bilkul, when I told bilkul, one of, bilkul, ah, but, okay. So uh, I told one of my professors after I had been admitted to Caltech that I was planning to go and study physics there. And he said, beta, so, uh, I, maybe for those of you who don't know Hindi, it's uh, okay. I roughly translate into sun, why are you jumping into a deep well? Uh, well, uh, I think he had my best interest at heart. He thought it would be a much easier life for me if I just wanted to go and um, do a master's and an MBA and then just find a good job. And uh, that I, I understand that, and that that could have also been a very uh, fruitful and productive and fulfilling life, but I chose a different one. So then I then I did my PhD, and then uh, Nandini and I got married. We were in fact graduate students together. Cornell, I had met her in IIT. Actually, I knew her from before that as well, and then. Uh, we stayed on in the US, uh, we got jobs, uh, we had two children. And then at some point, um, after we had settled down here and bought a house with two kids, uh, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in India uh, tried to lure us both back by saying, we'll, bo we'll offer both of you uh, positions. And that was a sort of tempting thing to do because I don't know if any of you have been to TIFR. I mean, it's just one of the most lovely places you can imagine working in anywhere in the world. Uh, it's at the tip of the island of Kolaba, right on the Arabian Sea. You live there, you work there. And so we went back and that was a hard transition because we had really never lived an adult life in India. You know, uh, That was a pretty hard transition life-wise. It was not a hard transition work-wise and actually we uh, both really enjoyed our time. We lived there for nine years and we thought this was a permanent decision to go back to India. But the only thing there was that uh, our kids were both born in the US and we felt that as they grew up, they would come away here and salaries in India at that time were not that great. And we thought we would just get disconnected from them. So we asked ourselves, even though we were extremely happy there, we said, okay, if we get opportunities to go back to the US, uh, would we go back? And I think it's actually a testament to Indian science, the work we did there, that even after nine years there, we were both able to get tenured positions in the United States, multiple offers. So we came back and- uh, This is, this and is one is point that. So, that I really want to pick you up on, Mohit, because right. you see, you have successfully moved back to India and lived for nine years and then successfully moved back to the US. Now, when the right. first time around, when you moved to India, how old were your kids at that time? So they were very young. They had no choice in the matter. <laughs> uh, they no if they had been either. older, it would have been a different story. <laughs> our older daughter was uh, about four, mm -hmm. and our younger daughter was uh, just under one year old when we moved back to India. But Having spent nine years means that your older daughter would have been 13 by the time. That's right. Back so when we birth. came back, that is correct. So when we came back, the older one had to join high school mm. and the younger one was still at the end of elementary school. Yes. So, so know, I think from, that from you and Nandini's perspective, I can understand because you had your basic grounding in India. 
but for the kids you know how was the settling in the, in the first phase coming down to india they were quite young mm. but what about uh, when they were moving back was that a kind of a challenge in terms of settling down i i think it was a challenge although we used to come very often because of work and um, so they were not unfamiliar with the us but certainly they had never been to schools in the united states so i think it was a challenge for them it was not easy and uh, now they're all grown up they're 13 and 27 so I, i know better but i i'm not even sure we as parents fully grasp the, the challenges that they were facing but uh, uh, so they were still they, young enough and they that they could adapt so another point which comes up is that both you and nandini are professors of physics So yes. is it uh, that at dining table you discuss quantum mechanics uh, or superconductivity? Not necessarily. <laughs> Not no. necessarily. Okay. No, we have lots of other common interests also. Mm-hmm. So we are often discussing completely different things <laughs> related to Indian classical music or art or politics or so the I, kinds of things or, or or cooking together or you know just hiking together doing things that Uh, people do even when they don't have uh, common professional interests no that's lovely i so i did hear about uh, some murmur about your interest in classical music so what is that interest is that into some instrument or is that in singing or is it just as a listener so the thing is actually when i was a little boy i used to actually play the sitar but uh, i didn't put in as much effort into it as is necessary to really play well and actually i knew a lot of music and i could see that i couldn't play at a level at which i would enjoy my own playing so i gave up which i regret but you know you don't have to do everything in the world in order to be able to really good at it I... but somehow i just gave up no no i agree. but i Hundred percent agree with you. Yes, you are saying. Yeah, something. yeah. But but anyway, uh, I have a very uh, sort of detailed knowledge of Indian classical music, Hindustani classical music, not Karnataka. Yeah. And uh, I I I listen to music very carefully and seriously. But I don't play anything. Yeah. So now, in regard to the work that you do, um, is it mostly teaching, or is it research, or is it a combination of both? So it's mostly research. Okay. Of course, I teach, uh, but at any American research university, hmm. teaching is like four to five contact hours a week, hmm. and that's it. Hmm. <laughs> teaching yep. meaning classroom teaching for undergraduates or graduate students, masters, PhD students. The rest of the time, actually, you are working on research. You get hmm. federally funded grants. Hmm. You are guiding PhD students in research. You are sometimes guiding undergraduates. I don't have too many undergraduates in my group. and you're collaborating with colleagues so vast majority of my time is on research and is your work mostly focused around superconductivity or is it into a number of other areas it is actually into a number of other areas there was a time in my life when it was very largely focused on superconductivity but in the last 15 years uh, in fact superconductivity has been a small part of what i do i would say I work a lot on uh, magnetic materials, magnetic memories. I also work a lot on. There's a sort of entire new field which brings together the mathematics of topology together with uh, uh, topics in physics. So I'm working a lot on topological matter. So is, this is again an interesting one, but because typically one's perception is that when you go into basic sciences. it is you know that one is doing research into some abstract stuff which nobody understands mm, but yeah. here i find you know and i remember how nandini explained quantum mechanics you know in our session that these are very much you know kind of the building blocks of applied research in so far as industry yeah. is concerned so do you have interaction with industry um not directly i think the kind of work that i do will not i imp- see industry the time scales are very different you're thinking about the next quarter mm-hmm. right in science you're thinking about the next quarter century mm-hmm. <laughs> so so it's a very different time scale so my work is not 
that applied that I would have direct uh, contact with industry. But for instance, I'm leading a very large project funded by the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, DARPA, which uh, they feel could have an impact on uh, the next generation of magnetic memories, uh, maybe on the time scale of five years, 10 years. So that's a, that's a short term science goal. <laughs> I love it. But you said it absolutely, you see, because I've actually recently kick-started another initiative, which is looking at, at how prepared we are for the brave new world, where, you know, the concept of work and income is so, so much changing. You know, we've got dynamics like the baby boomers are leaving the labor market. We've got the factors like the great resignation where people are wanting to get the right balance between you know work and life and at the same time you know there are new kind of careers emerging where people make money by playing video games or you know they become influencers and so on and so forth you know. so in that context you know what is the relationship between the building blocks especially industry academia and the point which came out was that you see if there was no such work that you are doing which has got a span of maybe about, you know, 10 to 20 years kind of a thing, there would be no ground, you know, for doing applied research, which is applied. So there is a sense that there is a combination or focus required on both. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's the time, I mean, like, for instance, what was John Bardeen's very first Nobel Prize? That was for the invention of the transistor mm. in 1947. Okay, so... Prior to 1947, the only things you had were vacuum tubes and they were hoping that they could have some solid state device to replace a vacuum tube. This is not a material you can go into a mine and get, you know, I mean, it's not a natural material. It's a man-made material. You have to first purify the semiconductor, then adjust the right amount of dopants. And if you look at the first transistor they made, it's like literally centimeter scale. And now mm. think about how many transistors <laughs> you have on the chip. Okay. Yeah. They had no idea that this would, re, you know, this would revolutionize computers, this would revolutionize communication. Mm. They just thought, okay, there is this old vacuum tube, the triode, let's replace it with something which is more robust. Mm. Mm. Absolutely right. right. Absolutely. So I think the thing is, uh, if you don't have pure research, mm. there's absolutely no innovation. But we would see, still be living in the era of triodes, you know. I, I couldn't agree more. I suppose the challenge comes in that in terms of funding. Because yes. you see the industry would be mostly wanting to apply or, you know, put funding into applied research. And thereby the government has to step in or, you know, there are companies who are kind of spending money or part of their revenue into basic research, fundamental research. But that is kind of, you know, few and far between. Mm -hmm. So uh, does a lot of your time get spent into applying for government grants and all that? Yes. Uh, more time than I would care to spend or tell you about. Uh, I see <laughs> this all the time in Australia when I spoke to, you know, uh, the, uh, the faculty in universities. And they tell me, oh my God, you know, how much effort they have to put in just to apply for grants every year. You know? That is absolutely correct. <laughs> uh, okay, so now, uh, you know, I also want to be discussed about uh, science and society. And I would like to, you know, get some perspective from you on this very topical theme of science and society. So it's over to you. Uh, and before I go that, uh, one question that I wanted to ask you was that, you see, you have also worked with another Nobel Prize winner. Um, who was that other Nobel, Nobel Prize winner that you worked with? So actually, my um, mentor after PhD was uh, Tony Leggett, Anthony Leggett at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And he has also won a Nobel Prize. Actually. Wow, wow, wow. And so how, how did it, how does it feel, you see, because, you know, I was going to, uh, in the December session, which I had to postpone because of my health issues, where I was positioning you with Rahul Pandit, with, you know, who's my batchmate, uh, and whom yes. you also know very well, who's now a very, also a very well known physicist in the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, he's traveling to Cambridge, so that's why he could not join, you know, today, but we'll be having him at a later session. So. 
uh, you know how uh, connected is the physics community so as to say is it a small world or what is it you know so um, it depends i mean i think uh, are you asking uh, within the united states are you asking globally. across globally nations? globally, globally. Hmm. okay so for instance so, okay just to give you some feel uh, every march is before the pandemic now things have been a little bit off the american physical society has a march meeting which is an international meeting uh, of people who are working in the kind of science that i do condensed matter physics which includes solid state physics liquids uh, many other fields like all the superconductivity uh, semiconductors topological materials magnetism all of this would come under that also the kind of stuff that rahul does uh like soft matter physics polymers even biophysics would come in the now we have a meeting where probably at last count 12000 people would oh, gather oh my god i see, I see. okay so That's it's a broad view people from uh, universities people from national labs people from industries so the reason i asked this was you know because you move between uh, us and india and then back again and yes. so you know uh, uh, like uh, 12000 people just for one conference is a very large number and so you got to be well known to be able to move, make that moves also very easily you know i mean uh, to get those offers and those kind of a thing and also to the extent that they were wanting to accommodate both you and nandini uh, in tiss you know so that is why i asked that is you know how how small is the community and all that kind of yeah it's not a particularly small community but um, of course uh, i mean compared to the number of people who are employed by you know the semiconductor industry the world wide it is a small number i understand so now coming back to the subject of science and society you know so let's hear your thoughts about you know what is uh, you know on, on this topical theme so i think we discussed this i think the thing is that the uh, society uh, sees innovations that happen on short time scales very easily and appreciates them it's much harder for people to appreciate innovations that are going to take a much longer time scale you know? i mean if you just think about something like i think we were discussing this that in the mid 1800s the royal society had a challenge saying how can we take music to the masses and not to the few elite who can go here in london symphony orchestra and the winner of that prize was that okay let's make copper tubing which carries these sound waves uh, by the streets of london and into people's houses so it's a very baroque kind of contraption and at the same time actually <clears throat> there were experiments and theoretical work going on in england on electricity and magnetism and faraday was trying to understand the connection and soon they would understand that there are something called electromagnetic waves and within a few years you could use electromagnetic waves to transmit that information right so you know sometimes society faces challenges that uh, you don't even understand how how they are going to be solved they thought that they had to transmit sound waves now we know we convert them into electric waves and just transmit them over across the world you know that's what's happening right now as we talk to each other and not only just sound we are also transmitting images so i think there are challenges like that i mean i think quantum technologies will do uh, for our children and grandchildren things which we can barely imagine so and i think there's a I lot will, of push the world over for i, uh, I 100% decisive. agree with you and on this i'll just make two comments and one is that you see when um, we were studying quantum mechanics at iit delhi you know everybody i think the majority of the class never understood the subject you know and when the exams came 75% of us took medical certificates you know <laughs> so that was one side but the second aspect is that today you know when we are living in a world especially we have seen in the past uh, 18 20 months or so is that the pandemic has you know met that all of us were operating in isolation on technology platform and with technology becoming so pervasive so that the, the discussion on stem has come back to fore you know? mm. right. 
and stem went to steam and from steam it went to stream and now again it is back to stem with a big force and also you know there is a lot of talk about you know inclusion and about women you know participation and this discussion has been going on for donkey number of years in terms of you know how to encourage people to kind of focus on to stem you know as a career path so do you see that happening because i think that is again a very very important aspect of science and society because to a certain extent we are talking about you know working on relatively larger timelines which people or who are tend to be more tactical do not really understand hmm? yeah so so do you see that importance of stem or, or is kind of happening in society at the moment i see for instance i think this think about uh, covid right the fact that we have these mrna based vaccines available mm. on the time scale of a year it's not happened in vacuum you know it has happened because if you look at the history of it uh, mrna research has been going on for the last 30 years mm. it's actually quite remarkable that multiple groups could produce vaccines on such a short time scale mm. right i mean if you think about previous mm. viruses which have ravaged the world mm. it hasn't been easy to find uh, vaccines like this but somehow instead of uh, instead of sort of saying what a wonderful thing science has done people are fighting political battles over uh, non existent issues yeah so i don't know what the solution to that is <laughs> yeah you know, i mean i'm seeing that very much in australia also um and i think to the western world to a certain extent because uh, it is a very individualistic society you know mm, so therefore these issues or you know one's own uh, privacy and concerns become you know equally important but this is not to go away from the fact as you rightly mentioned that you know developing a vaccine in such a short time and you know looking at new ways of and new uh, vaccines itself is such path breaking that this might become the new norm yeah. now in in that's the, right that's right. i mean they actually designed it if you look at what the bio and tech people did as soon as the uh you know genetic code was published mm. they sat down on their ipad mm. and designed it saying okay given this genetic code mm. these 10 vaccines you know look promising now let's go into the lab and try which one actually works so it's a completely new way of uh, attacking a problem like this and in fact at one of our gcc sessions we had uh, a senior vice president from moderna uh, who was a alumni from iit delhi and uh, you know like uh, it was very interesting to hear from him how you know they were operating at the cusp of you know the frontier edge of technology to see you know it was virtually a race against time at that particular point yes. in time hmm? Yes. so it is very very fascinating so as a last parting uh, this thing any take away for the audience that you would have or you would like to comment on it has been absolutely fabulous to have you and to listen to these perspectives and i will be touching base with you because we already you see in some of one of my other initiatives like i have uh, you know launched there is you know we are also trying to get the awareness between industry academy and collaboration and also to look at highlighting such kind of issues that if the fundamental research is not happening then where is the question of you know tactical solutions to the industry place which you know which mm. is what everybody seems to be looking for but any last uh, takeaways for the audience no i think the other i think really big problem facing humanity mm. is is basically climate change and uh, i think that is another place where uh, i think society will have to somehow gather the political courage to implement solutions which are based in data and in science i i 100% agree with you that you see now Uh, climate change is no longer something that we can leave to our grandkids mm. it mm. is hitting us right now we are seeing you know the impact of it already and the heartening thing to note is that the younger generation today is much more conscious about it and want to you know make a difference in so far as climate change and sustainability is concerned 
And I suppose the challenge which leaders from different parts of the world are facing is how to get the right balance between industrial growth to get people outside, out, you know, across the poverty line as well as to raise the standard of living with the with sustainability. You know. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, also, you see, the challenge is that, um, you see, how do we find a zero-cost solution which makes people to move across and adapt more environmentally friendly? Because we know that, you know, if, if people are asked to pay, may pay a premium, then yes, there will be certain, you know, kind of this thing. And, and yes, it is nice to have, you know, carbon trading and big industries talking about it, which is good. But this, this is something which is for everybody. It's not just for a few stakeholders here or there kind of a thing. And the other thing is more it is uh, inclusion. Hmm, because yes. diversity is, uh, is, yes, it is great to have a diverse population. But if there is no inclusion uh, and there is enough research to indicate that, you know, the positive aspects of having a multidiscipline or a diverse, you know, uh, workforce or uh, community the advantages which are there kind of a thing so i think both uh, inclusion and climate change are some of the current uh, you know areas of focus for the society so, so inclusion is really a social problem but right. climate change i think requires um, uh, science uh, of I, course I, inclusion impacts science in very negative ways also the lack of inclusion has impacted right. that's right that's right so, because no you you you're absolutely right absolutely right it is that uh, because of the smaller number of people who are women who are in in or people from you know uh, certain backgrounds who are uh, not uh, as much taking up you know stem or science for that matter uh, it is there but climate change is there for everybody i i couldn't agree more with really. so mohit absolutely wonderful once again a big round of applause to you and i will be in touch with you you know post this session to look at you know how to get you more involved because at the end of the day it is about building a platform in fact the uh, the next session which is going to happen on uh, two weeks from now on is going to look at the story of uh, you know indian school of business which was founded by rajat uh, and a couple of other people. So we'll have Rajat also over there and we'll have Pramath who is also one of the founding deans of uh, ISP as well as one of the founders of Ashoka. Um, you know, and then we're also going to pick up the stories on uh, Spick McKay and you know, a whole lot of different kind of themes. So it's going to be very, very fun and interesting. And as we look at it, because the alumni population tends to vary from right from 1966 batch to 2020, so the value proposition can vary, you know, depending on what people are looking for at what stage of life they are. Yes. So how do we collectively cater to that? All of these aspects is something, you know, we are trying to look at from a special interest group, but so be the case. Now, please give a big round of applause to Mohit, you know, and uh, uh, absolutely wonderful to have you across. Thank you. Thank you. Now we go across from Ohio to Singapore. And uh, Rajiv, it is 134 in Sydney. So in Singapore, it must be what, 1034 in the night? Yes, 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 it is 1034 for you. Fabulous. And we go for uh, almost a sub zero temperature in Ohio. What is the temperature in Singapore? Singapore is always, you know, <laughs> <laughs> tropical in nature. <laughs> T-shirt, t-shirt, I'm running, man. And the beautiful yeah. in Sydney. Technically, we are in summer. You know? <laughs> honestly, <laughs> honestly, in Singapore, one shorts and t-shirt is the only dress you need for the whole year. <laughs> That's the national dress of Singapore. You don't need, you don't need any warm clothes. <laughs> it is, it is close to twenty-eight degrees around here. You know. Oh man, and 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 the beauty is that we are supposed to be in summers in Sydney, but hmm. we've had, you know, I don't know whether it is because of climate change or not, but you know, we've had like every second day we're having rain, so we've never had a really forty degrees temperature in Sydney at least today. In Perth, etc., hmm. we've had, so it's been good so far. So tell me, before we get on to green finance, 
you know, and I know that, you know, uh, quite some time back we had you in GCC. But how did you land up in Singapore? And how did a textile engineer land up into fintech? You know? <laughs> good story, good story. Uh, I won't take too much time. Um, basically, um, after I uh, passed out of IIT Delhi, I um, got the opportunity to do my MBA in um, in Washington State. And uh, what happened was, uh, I I think I'm getting a bit of background noise. Maybe I don't know what. Uh, uh, are you getting any background? No, no, continue. Don't worry. Don't okay. Worry. Mm. All right. So. Um, I, I went to Washington State and uh, did my MBA at a U University of Puget Sound, which is in Tacoma, Washington. And uh, then I got a job uh, with a, a large Fortune 500 company called Warehouser Corporation. Now, Warehouser is one of the big tree growing companies, as they call it. They, they own so much land, it's just mind blowing. They own half of Washington State, they own half of Oregon State land, you know, forest land. <laughs> they own three quarters of Arkansas state land, you know, millions and millions and millions of acres of land. And all they do is they grow trees and, and wood products and all that. And they were exporting to all over the world. So I joined their um, uh, economic research team and I, I was given the charge of international um, uh, analyst. And that's where I got involved into Forex because, you know, all these things had to be shipped around the world. So I got involved in Forex, foreign exchange rates, Forex trading and blah, blah, blah. And then after about a few years, I moved to Mumbai, uh, got married. Uh, and then I was with Tata's. I joined Tata Burroughs that time. Tata became Tata Unisys mm -hmm. and Tata Infotech, then mm -hmm. now TCS. So the guys there, one of the senior executives there, Dr. Prakash Hebalkar, a lot of people know him in the industry. He said, you have so much Forex experience. Why don't you build a software for Forex trading? I said, sure. You know, I have that expertise. Let's do it. And, uh, and I built a, a, a Forex trading platform uh, in Seeps in Andheri. And it was the world's first Touch screen forex trading platform in the whole world. Okay, nobody <laughs> when, had heard of. That. When was that? Which year was that? 1986. Oh my god! Oh my god! Ah. Okay, 86. Me, to CRT monitors were there. You know those uh, black and white uh, CRT monitors, and later on color CRT monitors came. No, nobody even had used the mouse. Mm. You know. <laughs> Uh, so, us zamane mein, I found a California company that was manufacturing touch screens which you could retroactively fit onto a CRT monitor. Wow. Uh, wow. Usko leke, I put it on the, I got it imported into Seeps. On that time, it was a bloody headache, you know. The oh, I know. <laughs> then I fitted it onto the CRT. It had a small wire, hmm. RS232 interface, you know. RS232 say computer mein laga ke, I, we designed the human machine interface, you know, mm -hmm. because when you touch the screen, you had to, this, it had to do some action. Mm -hmm. So we designed all that and in 86, so I, I created the world's first touch screen forex trading system. And when I went to London to show it, all the traders fell off their chair. Yaar. They had never seen a no keyboard, you know, <laughs> I just did a, Five million dollar yen, you know, Citibank Tokyo Swiss touch 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 screen and deal prints out, positions are updated. What the pagal over? You know, they, they said how much it is I want to buy. You know how much it is? I went to Switzerland, Swiss banks wanted it, Belgian banks. So I was all over Europe. And that's how I landed up in Singapore because one company here had a trading system which they wanted me to market, and that's how I landed in Singapore. So, badi lambi kahani hai, but and then I got into fintechs. I joined FIS uh, Global. FIS is the world's largest fintech company. Uh, Thirty years ago, then I joined uh, Pfizer, which is the uh, second largest fintech company in the world. So, for last 35, 38 years, I've been doing only fintech. 
So there was uh, also something that you were involved in, which uh, the Prime Minister of Singapore inaugurated, and you know Narendra Modi was also there. So what was that? Uh, so what happened was, um, as I was getting into the whole fintech ecosystem, um, uh, uh, I was with Pfizer. I was head of strategy for Pfizer for Asia Pacific. And then this company, which is headquartered in Boston called Virtusa, they used to be, uh, they, they acquired a company called Polaris Kai consulting division they acquired. And Virtusa is uh, run by Sri Lankan CEO. So they, they acquired uh, Polaris and then they had an innovation labs. So they said, why don't you join us? Because we are chasing a deal uh, for uh, creating uh, like an API ecosystem in the fintech space. So what they're saying is the monetary authority of Singapore, which is the central bank, like the Fed, uh, they had this vision that banks had legacy systems and they were looking for innovative products. Fintechs had innovative products and they needed access to banks. And the only problem was fintechs had point solutions. Somebody did a payment AP, uh, system. Somebody did a, you know, KYC system. I said, you know, small, small incremental fintechs, they were creating solutions. But there was no ecosystem to glue these innovative fintech solutions with the legacy bank solutions. So MAS, Monetary Authority of Singapore said, we want to build an ecosystem where you can connect the banks and the fintechs and create innovative solutions for the whole uh, global market. And that is how APIX platform was born, APIX, API, API exchange platform was born. And so I was leading that whole initiative uh, after joining Virtusa and, and worked with the MS team to launch APIX in 2018, Prime Minister Modi flew to Singapore, the Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore also, and both of them launched APIX platform. Uh, which is now become a huge success. There are about 1,100 fintechs uh, on the Apex platform, and there are about uh, close to 100 banks on the platform. So they're all collaborating, creating innovative solutions uh, with APIs. You know, so it's all API nowadays, you know. Jo whatever system you used to do in banking for two years with $20 million and you know, the mainframe ka zamana, you know, your, yours and my zamana, uh, to 20 people, 220 million and two years, that all is shortened down to four weeks. You can do a banking system in four weeks with APIs. Well, this is fabulous. But when you work with Virtusa, uh, had did they already taken over the consulting arm of Polaris or was it yes. after that? Hmm? Okay. Yes, yes. So because in one of the GCC sessions, we had presented uh, the founders of, uh, you know, Nucleus, Polaris, the four people who were originally... Arun Jain. Yes, yes yeah, Arun Jain, Yogesh Andle, uh, uh, what is the... Uh, Vishnu and uh, uh, there's another Arun who collectively were, you know, the, the core group out of which Polaris, Nucleus and a whole lot of other fintech companies kind of uh, siphoned off. So very interesting. So now let's move on to green finance. Well, we've already talked about sustainability a bit with Mohit. So tell us, what is this green finance? Like, is it like, you know, green colored notes or is it kind of green colored <laughs> bitcoins or what is it, you know? It's a big topic, you know, ba ba see, basically, to explain it very simply, green finance is financing of green projects. Okay. So there's no magic there. Some people call it sustainable finance. Some people call it whatever. But basically, people uh, want to help the climate. They want to help, uh, uh, you know, sustainable environment. And, and they want... Uh, the, 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 the people who are coming up with these ideas for sustainability, for climate change, they want funding. So I was, uh, as, as, as part of my fintech ecosystem, I talked to hundreds of fintechs, you know, and, and all, across the world, you know, from Australia to US. So one of the things I found was there was, was a little bit of a gap, you know, he, um, Lots of people have ideas, lots of people. Uh, 
Uh, Abhay, can I ask hey, you to put, can hey, I ask sorry. you to mute your phone? Thanks. Yes. So, uh, so uh, what we are seeing is that, see, when it comes to finance, a lot of companies, startups, especially startups, they are competing for funds. You know, mm-hmm. so initially they have a great idea, but you know um, they don't have uh, either VC funds or investor funds, and 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 some of the banks will not lend to them because it's just you know creation of an idea, creation of a uh, of anything. So I, you know, coming from the Apex uh, ecosystem platform, I I thought that there could be a play here where we could create a green finance network. Okay. and that is how uh, i i i set up a company uh, recently in singapore called green fintech okay and 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 created this uh, idea that how can we match the 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 people who want finance the consumers uh, and they are the startups and all with the suppliers of finance and finance can come from vcs investors or Uh, the second option is lenders like banks you know so so that's where i said why not we build a green finance ecosystem where we have all these players in a platform so that is my whole idea of creating an ecosystem so in other words what you have done is that you've taken the platform thinking what you know you had used in apex and in the green finance ecosystem essentially getting different stakeholders who are involved in green finance you know and Absolutely. principally the demand and supply side also but also potentially other stakeholders so yes. tell me where is akshay and what has been akshay's role in this ha huh. so i'll i'll just share a couple of slides with you please, first please. on the green green finance thing yep yep and then i'll uh, bring in akshay he's just right here next to me i'll bring in him because he's also involved in that so uh, so first um, let me show the slide um, but before that i'll just uh, i'll just quickly introduce akshay he is here hi oh so i can make out that there is one difference you know that you wear glasses <laughs> and rajiv doesn't wear glasses hmm? well, <laughs> i think we both do at times <laughs> The other thing I can also make a note is that uh, Rajiv appears to sh- uh, shave every day, and you let it grow at times. You know? well, lovely, lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you, Akshay. Yeah. And Thanks I so also want me. to pick up on your term. You know, your the time that you did in environmental science uh, at Berkeley. Mm, so I want to pick up on that also. Um, sure. So. Well, let's go across in whatever may you do. You want to first show the slides, uh, Rajiv? Yeah, or? yeah, okay. yeah. I'll share share the slide quickly, and then I will uh, pass over to Akshay, so you can sure. have a chat with him. Sure. I'll just share my screen. All right. You should be able to see my screen, right? Yes, we can see that. So let me play that. all right perfect so what remember i was telling you about the whole uh, green finance network that i'm i'm creating and this is a b2b platform um, and and with the newly registered company now both akshay and i are uh, co-founders of this company because he is coming i'm coming from a fintech background finance and technology and he's coming from a environmental and sustainability background you know so uh, so that's how we uh, you know thought that this could be something that could be of interest to everybody around the world you know so the the issue we found was and this is the problem we are trying to solve is startups are looking for uh, funding and investment and they compete with the regular financing initiatives and so the solution was to set up this platform where you know you can have climate friendly and sustainable projects now as you know there is another bigger problem which is nowadays referred to as green washing okay everybody is saying i am green you know and you know i am i am the world's best green company i have the lowest carbon credit carbon emissions and you know they they are like 
fooling the public you know so we we thought that this is a very important part of this ecosystem is how can people trust and rely that this company is really green okay so in that context what we did was i because i uh, singapore has uh, and and you can go to the uh, mas website this is the federal equivalent of the fed federal reserve or reserve bank of india monetary authority of singapore and they came up with a green finance action plan you know some time back and they want to be the leading center for green finance in asia so singapore wants to be the global leading center for green finance and they have come out with an action plan of strategies and this is a, a, a like a strategy plan and there in that there was a working uh, industry task force set up in 2021 and they said they want to partner with fintech companies this is you can you can read to connect investors or lenders with companies or startups for esg funding so the, the the whole central bank was thinking exactly what we were thinking you know and they have come out with a almost a 2 billion dollar initiative to promote this kind of a scenario of course it's not all software but it's basically the ecosystem so taking that into consideration we found that you know and akshay did some research on his own we found that it's going to be a almost a huge investment green investment needed in asean countries alone the 10 countries of asean in till 2030 you know massive amount of funding is going to go into green uh, projects so if i may interrupt you so are we talking of 200 billion only in asean yes oh wow wow really huge, huge see because just imagine the 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 transition from you know everything from supply chain logistics factories transport you know green green vehicles green energy you name it sustainability green buildings you cover the whole range you know you're talking of lots and lots of investment and so so we felt that this is something that i think getting early on into this game will be a big game changer and so what we did was we created a prototype of this ecosystem and 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 i will um, i will just quickly show you let's hope that this works because i'm going to go to the the figma demo you know the the prototype demo um let's see if if, if the image is choppy please let me know uh, otherwise we are just uh, can you see this yep you can see that okay great so what we did was we said let's have an ecosystem where we have the startups or even you know there could be company projects uh, that are uh, in the green uh, sustainable area then we have investors or lenders then we this is where the uh, the trust part comes in we we wanted expert advisors on this ecosystem and then we have the regulators so there were four like user personas that we wanted on this platform and so if i i mean this is just a prototype so you could be a startup company who is starting a green project here is a lender investor a lender or a vc you know and the expert advisor and then the regulator so we said you know if i am a startup then i could have a few projects you know i want to set up a solar farm i want to set up a wind farm you know there could be many projects that you list on this platform mm. and then you know you could have like the amount of funding it's a bit small here like 1.2 million is required for the initial funding 2.4 million required for wind farm you know mm. so you can you can list your parameters here on the on the platform mm. now a lender or an investor could select the area they want to lend in carbon Mm. emission mm. solar wind they can finance up to this mm. or if it's a investor he can issue capital up to 10 million you know so mm. so depending on who you are are you a lender or an investor you decide mm. uh, the amount that you can finance per project and the type of projects you want to get involved in then the third one was the expert advisor 
So the expert advisors, and we'll have a ecosystem of expert advisors who will be registered, you know, who will rate these projects. So they would rate a solar farm project, they would rate a wind farm project. So these guys know how these projects are handled and then give them a rating. Mm. So anything more than 75 meets the United Nations, you know, sustainable development goals. You know? mm. So we could have that kind of a benchmark. Mm. And then we have the regulator. Mm. So the regulator is basically a monitor of this platform, mm. saying how many startups listed, how many companies listed, how many projects were funded and so forth. Mm. So this was the, this was the whole idea of getting the whole ecosystem to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you match these guys? Mm -hmm. So if I go to the match, it's called green finance matching. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a lender or an investor, I, I will have um, like all my projects. I, I mean, I'll see all the projects mm -hmm. and the ratings, mm -hmm. which have been given by the expert advisors. Mm -hmm. So if I swipe left, no interest. This is Tinder of <laughs> Tinder of green finance. Mm. Okay. So mm. if I swipe left, no interest. But if I swipe right, mm. then I get connected to the startup. Mm. And then I can start a conversation between the lender, investor and the startup. That means I'm interested in this project. So you select each project right or left. And you connect like a Tinder matching, you know. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing we had was the community. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a, a community where you know people compare notes, uh, industry initiatives, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So this, you know, is uh, what we we came up with. So this is actually uh, you know very nice because what you've done is that you have listed four critical stakeholders you you know listed down a criteria for each of those stakeholder groups and then you know you lead it down to the matching but in the process not only a matching but you also creating a reference frame where people can benchmark you know where does this project stand in terms of greenness you know? Um, I suppose the question which comes to my mind is that what is the business model or the commercial model, you know, because you are making all the investments. Uh, will the people have to pay to list on this platform or how does that work? You know? Yeah. See, again, look at it from this point of view. Okay. Um, Abe, once again, can I ask you to mute yourself? Oh, uh, I thought it was muted already. No, you are somebody unmuted you. So let me. Hey, can you mute yourself? Uh, can you mute from me? I cannot figure yes. out how to okay, mute myself. Okay, okay, hang on a sec. Let me. Uh, sure, please. Yes. No, I, I, Pradeep, it was me. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So oh. now back to huh. you, uh, Rajiv. Yeah. So see, see the. The business model is that if I let me go back to the to this, see the the investors. I mean, if you look at it from the lenders and the investors' point of view, they are looking for projects that give them return, you know, or or funding that can give them a return. They are creating a asset, you know, for their organization. So they are very keen to know that this finance this this uh, project is. Uh, properly rated it is be it's it's a it's it's a question of trusting that uh, evaluation rather than somebody saying yeah i am green you know mm. and and take and, and fund me so it is a industry led ecosystem mm. now because they are getting an asset and they are going to make money you know it could be a 20 year you know uh, 50 million dollar deal let's say you're setting up a wind farm you know uh, now, those kind of projects give massive returns for these people, whether you're an investor or a lender. Mm. And they are very, they will be very keen. And the business model is they will be charged 
the the bulk of the platform fees the startups and the companies are looking for funding you know so they will have to pay a nominal fee to to stay on the platform mm. so that's the business model we are looking at so it will depend on you know kind of revenue size or the deal size which will have a certain amount of uh, listing fee or whatever it is kind of a thing and i suppose uh, you see the community building uh, is extremely important because end of the day you know you need to have that uh, uh, discussion going on within the wider community which can then you know go down and lead to actual projects mm. so uh, absolutely wonderful uh, love it and it will be uh, nice to see to track the journey uh, now i want to go across to uh, akshay so akshay tell me that you went to berkeley yes mm. now the very fact you went to berkeley you could have gone into any subject you know and it yeah. is pretty computer science is very hot at the moment yes mm, why yes how oh, it's been hot for quite donkey number of years you know <laughs> and so why did you choose environmental science as against uh, computer science or other options that you could have yeah yeah so uh, you know it's as, as we've kind of talked a little bit about you know it's it's a really exciting and new area that's kind of emerging um, you know a lot of things are really changing within the environmental space and it's really becoming applicable you know of course to businesses investments as you kind of rate esg and you you know you look at these sorts of models but um you know something i'd love to talk about a little bit more is also how it's actually becoming more ingrained with technology because as we look at renewable solutions you know renewable energy the question also comes up you know how do we really innovate um and adapt to the systems around us already you know how do we creatively figure out ways to save energy um you know apart from just you know standard things like a carbon footprint calculator or things like that that we might have seen um so i'd love to actually uh, you know if, if yeah possible, but let it. me let me add one more thing uh, to your question uh, hari he went to berkeley in uh, for undergraduate in 2018 okay right uh, he got admission into a field which is so relevant today called molecular biology right which 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 is what he got admitted into berkeley and that molecular biology to apna you know covid would have uh, is the right place to be but what he did was i don't know how but he said yeah this wahan ja ke you know he realized that sustainable environment yeah. uh, you know the whole climate change thing is becoming very hot so he actually switched his major to environmental yes wow wow, wow. <laughs> from, from molecular biology so, so lots of people are also exploring and moving into those fields you know even after you know either during their undergrad years or after a graduate degree um but yeah so that's that's kind of the you know there's various different pathways uh, to kind of go 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 to that location and go through those explore those careers explore these different pathways within you know um not just esg or these areas but just you know uh, the intersection of technology and the environment um but and, and, and also kind of, you see i yeah. also ask you another question because i've been to the berkeley campus the the campus sure. you know it's like a city uh, yes. and it's so beautiful you know with lush green lawns that yes. when i would say that the place where you actually want to study you know i mean uh, uh, it, it's that beautiful you know uh, but you were also in california which is the hub for innovation and for investments yes. into all the hot areas you know yes but, so why did you not stay back in california oh um yeah i i was um you know i i wanted to kind of work there and and get some experience there for a while um and and now i'm i'm back in asia i kind of want to explore what the new opportunities are here when it comes to sort of the energy space because um you know within this within this region it's still sort of as i mentioned emerging you know nothing's really yet concrete so i think some of the experience i've actually had working for some energy you know it started especially like at the intersection of energy technology and finance i can kind of apply that knowledge more here um so that's something that i'm really looking to do um and bring that kind of knowledge back yeah great so, stuff now you wanted to show us something yes just just some brief slides yeah um so yeah after he graduated he worked for the, some uh, startups in the bay area hmm. so one of them he's going to share uh, his study i'm i'm going to share the screen he's just got a couple of slides yeah sure sure i'll keep it i'll keep it super brief <laughs> um yeah but you know just kind of on that subject of sustainable energy management and the question of you know 
it is, is ESG or is, you know, are these really specific models that we kind of see the only way? Well, there are sort of alternatives that have been dis discovered in, you know, places like California and Texas. And I'll just kind of introduce one that I've, you know, had the chance to kind of sample and, and you know, see if it piques, piques anyone's interest. Um, but, you know, a company I worked for actually uh, was called Omconnect. Uh, it's, it's still operational, fantastic company. Uh, they focus on uh, energy markets specifically in California and Texas, as I mentioned. And they actually uh, harness technology, um, you know, to, to actually help solve the climate crisis. So um, they actually produce a digital gamified experience that, um, you know, helps actually encourage homeowners across California to, uh, you know, reduce their energy, power down their homes um, in order to actually save their electricity bill. But then homeowners will actually also get paid out by the company. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but, you know, they have kind of like an online website and what they'll do is on a weekly basis, once you sign up, um, you'll actually connect to your utility system at your home and you'll be sent notifications for what they call ohm hours which are basically one hour long energy saving events where you'll get a notification and then you can you know manually power down your home um there are ways to automate that which i'll get into but uh power down your home you know you'll save energy for that period those are usually peak energy usage periods where you know everybody in california is usually you know, eager to use energy needs electricity and all, all of that um so it's a really nice kind of fun engaging way to you know uh just engage your family members, you know, work on something together, but also sort of contribute to the sustainability clause. And, and so, um, you know, the key value props really for, for this are obviously, as I mentioned, you know, because you participate in multiple events like these, you know, multiple times a week, you'll actually end up saving on your, you know, average monthly energy bills. You'll save money out of your pocket on your energy bills, but you'll also earn points um, every time, you know, you are able to beat the certain energy goals uh, that you achieve. Uh, each time you participate in an OM hour. So you'll actually get points and then those can be cashed out for, act, for actual money that the company will send. Um, and, you know, that's, we've seen sort of, that's the core model, but we've seen new products uh, and, and new experiences that they're coming out with, you know, for example, doing one uh, scenario, modeling one scenario where um, they'll show you like a sliding scale of $1,000 to $5,000 you can just earn straight up if you reduce all your energy uses for the entire summer period, which is kind of like a peak energy period, obviously, because people use air conditioning in California a lot. Um, you know, if you reduce it by 60 to 70 percent, you know, across all your, you know, all your energy usage for that whole summer, you can get paid out like five thousand dollars. So that's a really strong financial incentive or even auto ohms, which are kind of like shorter, more flexible hours. As I mentioned, it's it's kind of based on an energy market. Right. So peak energy usage demand kind of fluctuates very, very rapidly, you know, not just every every you know week or day, but, you know, every hour really. So you can do these 15 minute events that, um, you know, participate uh, by actually automating how you power down your home, not just manually going around, but connecting smart plugs, um, you know, to appliances, to devices, so that, uh, you know, you'll, you'll basically able to just automatically, you know, without having to do anything, power down your home and save money. Um, and this will, I'll just kind of touch really briefly on, you know, okay, how is this even possible, right, first of all. So um, at Home Connect Center, there's really sort of four core, you know, stakeholders we have to think about, right? We have to think about regulators, we have to think of energy utilities, uh, and by that I mean like the utility companies in California, for example. Um, we have to think about partners, you know, we use to extend a product. And then we have to think about the actual end users or customers who are, of course, our daily homeowners. So really with regulators, it's um, something really interesting. So uh, California actually has a system that the state, uh, you know, sort of organizes called DRAM, Demand Response Automation Mechanism. Um, or sorry, demand, demand response auction mechanism. And what that does is when they plan their annual energy usage, their production, based on you know, what they think California you know, users will just, homeowners will just use in terms of an energy basis. Um, you know, they'll work with utilities like Pacific Gas and Electric or San Diego Gas and Electric, will plan out and model all that out. And then they've also provided a market where these utilities can actually outsource um, you know, their, the energy that they need to deliver to the grid and say, um, you know, to third party companies, okay, you know, look, we need, we know we need to, we're projecting we deliver, you know, X amount of megawatts, for example, can you guys provide, you know, 5% of this for the, uh, for, uh, you know, in this year or 10% of this, right? And so what will happen is there'll essentially be a bidding mechanism um, where, you know, entities can set up shop and they can say, okay, you know, we'll match whatever bid you want, a 5% bid, 2% bid, and we'll commit to delivering that amount of megawatts so that you guys don't have to provide. And so that's really where companies like Home Connect come in, you know, and other competitors like Lead Better. They will you know, run these sort of uh, what we call demand response energy programs and experiences that will actually help provide uh, megawatts to the grid. And what will happen is they, they will have agreements with these public utility companies like PG&E, uh, San Diego Gas and Electric, 
um, you know, that they will essentially have to commit. And that's where this really, this digital experience comes from. Um, you know, talking more about the energy utilities, well, how does this then go about with the energy utilities company looking you have this contract? Well, there's a situation and a scenario called Rue 24, which will basically involve, you know, the utilities and the right, uh, utilities and uh, companies like OmPlanet saying, okay, we need to provide our energy usage data um, to, to uh, OmPlanet that OmConnect can actually track and understand how users are performing and can model and understand if they're on track to, um, to reach uh, the, you know, the, the energy requirement. Uh, that will, again, as I mentioned, uh, you know, be sort of augmented by the partners, like um, e-feeding, for example, which uh, OmConnect is partnered with to get like an automation plug that they'll send and sell to users. We'll be able to kind of automate the energy saving events, they'll be able to stay, you know, save energy frequently. And then all that information, again, will, you know, will basically be We'll go to the company, employees, and to the customers where we will be able to plan out the home hours, energy saving events, and eventually the company will be able to meet its contracts for, for the year and then bid again for the next year. So, very interesting. So, in a way, the, uh, the, what, what uh, the company is trying to do is to introduce gamified incentives for moving into a smart yes. home or a smart building environment. Hmm. Right. And, yeah. and uh, what what uh, is it is doing is also creating a platform or an ecosystem by getting you know the utility companies to focus on their core functionality and also getting you know other partners who can yes. help in the process to get the ecosystem up and running kind of thing. Absolutely, and it's it's exciting because you know it's not just about figuring out how to deliver more energy. It's about figuring out okay, you know we know these you know energy prices and demand is really high. Instead of instead of just figuring out about delivery, why don't we just reduce it by using these fun gamified methods, right? Why don't we just you know say okay, if you just power down and you amplify that effect for one household across you know five hundred thousand users, for example, active users that um, Home Connect has, you know, and still growing, you know, that can be amplified and you can save so much energy, you know, at each of these hours that you have, or even these fifteen minute events, and it makes the market very flexible, uh, and it ends up saving energy. So, you see, in a very different kind of a way, we've got smart metering operating in, you know, Australia, where yeah. there are tariffs which are operating into different uh, times of the day, looking right. at, you know, uh, getting more of a domestic load into off-peak hours of industries by yes. having different tariff rates, you know, but I uh, love it. Love it. Very, very good. Man. But yeah, it's an innovative new model, you know, kind of a fun way to engage your family, but also, you know, deliver, deliver on energy, energy savings, basically. Excellent, excellent. You see, you see, this is where I see, you know, um, the bigger impact. Yeah. As we were discussing earlier, you see, in the sustainability challenge at the moment, it is getting the right trade-off in terms of growth and development with the sustainability and climate change. You know. mm. And uh, you see, where we are able to motivate, you know. The, um, the 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 participants across the board and more holistically is either where it is a zero cost uh, you know incentive that they don't have to pay anything more but yeah. also to you know give them provide some incentives for moving across you know so I think it, it's just both of these things which will have a biggest impact now. so this is uh, absolutely wonderful um, I, I loved it uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, if anybody wants to ask, you know, please raise your hand and uh, we can have a direct conversation. And you see, there are, see, in, in when we look at the community of uh, IIT Delhi alumni, uh, see the community is very large. We've got 55,000 people and there are people also on this call today who are doing some very good work in terms of storage batteries, you know. Because that is again an area where um, you know, which which is really appearing as as one of the you know kind of critical bottlenecks in terms of you know the storage is a big element kind of a thing. Now I also want to cover on the issue of cryptocurrencies and the kind of energy consumption that happens in the case of cryptocurrencies. But before that, I see Vijay Ivory is raising his hand. So Vijay, yes, over to you. What question you would like to ask? Hi, this is for Rajiv Madani. Rajiv, you did your B.Tech in uh, textile technology, and uh, how come you changed over to the finance? So, 
So, uh, Vijay, Rajiv, I see you may have joined a bit late, but uh, uh, Rajiv covered this aspect just about a couple of, uh, about half an hour back. But uh, I will leave uh, Rajiv I, comment again. Yeah. Yeah, no, Vijay, I was just uh, mentioning before probably you joined that after IIT Delhi, I went to, I, I actually I didn't. Yeah, you uh, went to Washington. I heard that you went to Washington. That's the uh, 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 I went to Washington. And Maybe I missed one. Uh, and when I did my MBA, the first job that I got, and that generally, you know, kind of shapes uh, where you are headed. The first job, oh, okay. I, that job that I got was in a, um, a, a Fortune 500 uh, marketing and economic. Yeah, yeah, company. I heard that. I heard that. Yeah. Okay, uh, okay. That, now you that's where the... I got into Forex, you know, and that's how I moved in. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Then in 85, you made that uh, software and all that. Yeah, I, I heard you fully. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I think I missed that point. No worries, no worries. So, uh, any other questions by anybody else? Just for you, everybody's info, Vijay and I are uh, in, were in the same uh, class in IIT Delhi in textile engineering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sitting on the same bench many times. Sitting on the same bench. <laughs> and, and, and just for everybody's benefit, both of them have changed their professions where Vijay, <laughs> Indeed, yes. Vijay is now becoming a real estate tycoon in Toronto, whereas <laughs> Rajiv is becoming a fintech guru in Singapore. But uh, uh, anyway, so if that be the case, then any last takeaways for the audience uh, you have, uh, both Rajiv and Akshay? You have any? Uh, I mean, yeah, no, just uh, takeaways would just be that, you know, um, I, I think this, this space that we, you know, we're kind of dabbling and working in is, is really just an exciting space. I think it's an innovative space. So, you know, I would just challenge the audience to kind of take a look at, you know, um, you know, what they're, what they think might be, you know, creative ways to kind of solve the climate crisis or improve at least, you know, um, certain aspects of sustainability around them and think of like creative ways to sort of engage you know, designers, engineers, you know, social scientists, psychologists, whoever, um, to come up with new and creative ideas because you, you, you never know what you might come up with, I think. Yeah. Um, and, and who you might speak to. And, and we are, we are definitely looking for partnerships, yeah. you know, for our initiative. Um, if, if, uh, if there are people in the audience who want to, um, you know, get into the green finance ecosystem or the energy savings ecosystem. Yeah. We'll be very happy to talk to them and, and promote these uh, globally. Yeah, absolutely. So, excellent. Uh, and I may just kind of mention through another of my initiatives through uh, what is called InSquare, which is uh, inclusive innovation in the new normal, uh, you know, where the focus is on inclusion, but also into the new normal where sustainability is, is a big theme. So we've already had events. We've had actually had a Indo-Israel joint event in November, where we, you know, looked at women in ESG. Hmm. And uh, we are about to have an event in the month of March, which is Indo-Netherlands, you know, collaboration, um, and it will again look at, you know, sustainability and look at complementation between what is happening in that country and in India. So, but apart from that, there is a whole lot of uh, initiatives that I am, you know, uh, kicking off or still in planning on the sustainability side and it will be really lovely to, you know, loop you guys into it because mm -hmm. we've already kind of established a big network which is growing um, and it will be good to leap you into that, you know, and this is from right from places like Canada, Singapore, uh, you know, other parts of the world as well. Um, so, well, thank you so much for joining in, both you as well as uh, Mohit today. And with that, uh, I will say, you know, once again, have a lovely morning, evening, afternoon, night, whatever it is in your part of the world. Enjoy your morning cup of tea. Enjoy your afternoon lassi if you want to have a lassi. <laughs> or enjoy your evening glass of wine or, uh, you know, maybe a nightcap, whatever it works in your part of the day. So with that, uh, and I can see Mr. Dr. Somnath Mitra's beard seems to keep growing all the time. And, <laughs> and, and I can also see uh, Mohit, so Mohit, so good that you were able to join us and get up early in the morning. I know that it was nine o'clock in U.S. East Coast, 
and likewise for Rajiv and uh, these people stayed up late to you know give us a session so thank you all once again joining us and it's a one big community that we are building in and there are so many such interest groups you know which are kind of coming in and uh, it will be lovely how we take it into the small group activity focused on to different themes. Bye for now. This is Pradeep from Sydney signing off.